Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Harriet, and I will be your host tonight. Thank you for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful and insightful time. This event is brought to you by Decode as part of our speaker series. As a bit of background for those of you who aren't familiar with us yet, Decode is a global community of ambitious creators and passionate builders. We are a nonprofit with roots in the tech and entrepreneurship community in Silicon Valley, and we teach entrepreneurship classes at Berkeley every semester. We hope to give students, entrepreneurs, founders, and investors a platform to share, connect, and be inspired. Over the past five years, our annual Decode Innovation Conference has been the largest tech and innovation conference co-hosted by Berkeley and Stanford students, alumni, and entrepreneurship centers. We have had over 10,000 audiences every year from all around the world. Some of our notable speakers include founder and CEO of Zoom, board member of Tesla and SpaceX, CEO of Y Combinator, and CEO of Google X, among many others. Our 2020 conference back in October garnered 1.3 million views across 44 countries and have thus prompted us to kick off the speaker series, with today being our ninth session. Our next session will be on May 5th, so next Wednesday, from 1 to 2 p.m. PDT in the afternoon. It's a bit earlier than usual, but we'd love to see you there. You can also check out our social media for more information. And we also have a lot more upcoming events. Also, if you would like to volunteer with Decode on future events, or if you'd like to discuss any potential partnerships with Decode, please do email us at careers at decode.build. Um, I will send the email out in the chat. So now for today's logistics, after the fireside chat, there will be a Q&A session. So you can send in any questions that you have for our speaker via Zoom chat. We will try to go through as many questions as possible, but due to time constraint, we will not be able to cover all of them. For those of you selected to join the round table, it will be after the Q&A, so please stay and wait to be invited to the breakout room. So for today's session, we are excited to welcome Donald Lewin, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Computer History Museum and former Corporate Vice President at Microsoft. The Computer History Museum is a nonprofit organization with a four decade history, exploring the world's computing past, digital present and future impact of technology and humanity. And Donald directs the strategic planning, fundraising and ongoing operations there. Prior, Donald led Microsoft's work in applying technology for public good during a 17 year tenure. He collaborated cross company and with external partners to, to focus on scalable impact with a portfolio that includes establishing the company's global startup and venture capital engagement model as campaign and civic tech engagement efforts, affordable internet access initiatives, environmental sustainability work and partnerships with leading research universities. So prior to Microsoft, Donald accrued 30 plus years of leadership experience in Silicon Valley with companies that include Next, Apple, Go Corporation and Sony. Among others, Donald has served on the board of the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, UI Labs, Advanced Energy Economy, and currently serves as a board director at StartX. He is also on the advisory council for the Department of Politics at Princeton University, where he also holds an AB in politics. The session will be moderated by Shuo Chen, who is the general partner at IOVC, a lecturer at UC Berkeley, and a faculty member at Singularity University. So um, let's welcome Shuo and Donald. Thank you very much, Harriet, and uh, really excited and honored to have you with us today, Daniel, um, given your decades of experience across startups, corporates, um, and also now um, the nonprofit world. So thank you so much for making time today. Oh, and I think you might be on mute. That's the famous statement of the day, yes. <laughs> You're Glad on. Here. No, I'm happy to be here, sorry. All good. Thank you. Um, so uh, you have some background on our audience already. We have a lot of Berkeley and Stanford students as well as alumni, as well as um, obviously working professionals with more experience, uh, but really would love to start with your story of how you became president of the Computer History Museum. Uh, the museum specifically, they asked me if I would do it. And I, I thought, I thought about what I wanted to do. And uh, as long as they agreed, I said, I said, yes, but I mean, there's a, there's a longer road prior to that. Um, I've been friends with the founders of the museum since it originally opened in Boston some 40 years ago. It is the, uh, the child, if you will, of, of Gordon uh, and Gwen Bell. Gordon Bell is 
noted um, computing, high performance computing architect from the company once known as Digital Equipment Corporation. Um, he and his wife Gwen founded the museum in Boston in the early 1980s, uh, to which I, I attended the, the opening and uh, it was sort of the beginning of the PC era. Um, and uh, anyway, I'd been friends with most of the trustees over time. Um, they were without a CEO. Um, I had been involved in a number of nonprofits, other museums, one in particular in the Bay Area, the Tech Interactive, where I ran a, a, a global program uh, as, a, as a board sponsor, uh, Tech uh, Benefiting Humanity on a global scale. Um, and so I didn't want to be a trustee and I didn't want to do anything that I'd done before. Um, and so when they asked me if I would run the museum, uh, I told them I would think about it because I was at a stage of knowing what I didn't want to do. Um, and that included uh, anything that I'd done before. And I'd never done something like this before. Um, so I took several months to think about it, um, six weeks, eight weeks, uh, and then met with the search committee. Uh, and the one uh, opening remark they made was, you're here to interview us. And I said, well, thank you for that because if you're interested in what I'm interested in, then maybe maybe this will work. Uh, and so I laid out a scenario of three things that I wanted to focus on and they said, okay, and I said, yes. So. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and, and actually um, pre-COVID, uh, every year Decode's annual forum had always been hosted for one day at the Computer History Museum. So for folks who have been around for a while, they would have been to Computer History Museum by a few times by now. Yeah. Uh, but maybe we should backtrack a little bit to talk about the very early parts of your career. Uh, what you studied during college, what were your enjoyable things to do, um, and walk us through your career, if that's okay. Sure, happy to give you a, a little bit about my journey. Um, I ended up at Princeton in a, in a roundabout way. Like most of you, I had choices. Um, and um, I, chose, I chose Princeton for several reasons. Uh, and uh, I ended up studying politics um, as a result of a discovery that hit me in the face uh, within the first several days that I was on the campus, because I'm speculating that a fair number of you are pretty good at math or you wouldn't be where you are right now. And, I thought I was pretty good at math. And then I went to Princeton and uh, I found out that I was not a mathematician uh, quickly uh, in a matter of minutes of being on the campus and meeting a few people who were mathematicians. Um, and I was interested in, in, uh, in social movements in particular, given the sign of the times back then. This was, I graduated in 76. So you can, you can date me. I'm pretty much pro forma in terms of when I entered school and exited school. And, um, and I met some professors that I really, really, really liked. Uh, it's an unusual institution given its brand name and the size of the endowment. Uh, and on a relative basis, um, the endowment is four times larger than any other institution on the, on the planet. So it's a lot of resource and a lot of access to full-time professors. And so I found uh, two that I really enjoyed uh, through some introductory courses. Um, and I was excited about the nature of the department um, and several of the faculty advisors that I met. Um, and in the end, uh, I thought I was gonna be a lawyer. Um, and so uh, one, one advisor was particularly uh, focused on civil liberties, uh, which at the time, um, given the sign of the times today, not that it's changed that much for the last pick a number uh, in the United States of America, 400 years, civil rights was a real issue um, on all fronts. Women's rights was a real issue on all fronts. And now we look at gender of all type and, and the rest. Uh, and uh, there were some structural things that were brewing uh, as a result of the war uh, in Vietnam, uh, which of course was not really a war, just a conflict. Um, and then um, residency requirements changed and 18 year olds were allowed to vote at the same time. And so I got involved in, in wanting to understand how to coalesce 
large groups of people um, and to create followings, which in the end, when I ended up uh, through serendipity in Silicon Valley, um, led me uh, through, again, uh, moments in time and, and good fortune. The first quote unquote real job that I uh, had was um, working for Sony. And it was a friend of mine from school who had accepted the job, but soon thereafter, within weeks, got the job that he really wanted uh, and was going to resign. And upon resigning, invited me to join him um, to, <laughs> when he went in to resign. And, uh, and I did, and, and he said to his boss then, uh, you hired me fresh out of school and I can walk and talk and this guy can walk and talk too. So it turns out uh, I got a job on the spot and went to work the following week. Um, and the week that I went to work is the week that Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak left the garage and moved into 600 square feet of office next to my office. So sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. <laughs> and uh, so I met them right away. And for those who know anything about or have read anything about Steve Jobs, he was very keen on brand and uh, design and if you look at the history of consumer electronics in the United States and in general consumer electronics coming out of Japan, particularly then, um, Sony was a lesser tier brand in Japan by far, but was purposeful in marketing in the United States through design and brand and um, was charging a premium again, and they were a lesser brand in Japan by far, um, but they uh, charged a premium of nearly 15% Sounds a lot like Apple products. Uh, and, uh, and they did so because when you were asked the question, why did it cost more to buy a Sony? The answer was because it's a Sony and that's why you pay more. So anyway, so that's how I ended up uh, kind of in, in Silicon Valley um, and you know, in my early uh, school period, it was, it was focused on, on organizing and looking at structural change and the tech industry, microprocessor based personal computing was about changing structures and empowering people. And so I've been on that treadmill ever since. Um, um, coincidentally, my first laptop was a Sony and that was before I transitioned to a Mac. And I'm sure is the case for many people sitting here today, your work has directly impacted our lives and the way that we interact with technology. So um, it's really cool that uh, you were there in the very early days. And I think what's really fascinating is that you went from the corporate world to the world of startups and building new organizations back to the world of corporates. If you don't mind walking us through a little bit, um, some of your thinking and how you made those decisions, that would be really great. The, the, would you repeat the question again? I was uh, something just flashed on screen and I read it while you were speaking. Sorry, I can't okay. you know, that thing about multitasking is not true. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, I was just asking for your decision making process when you transitioned from the corporate world to the world of building new organizations and then ultimately um, deciding to go back to the corporate world. Yeah. Um, you know, when I went to work for Apple, um, it helped that the founder of the company is the one that wanted to hire me. So that, that was good. Um, and all the work that I did at Apple was not what was presented to me as my job. Um, I started to look behind the curtain of, of, of market conditions. Um, and I started with the market as opposed to with the technology. And there was an awful lot of, of at that moment in time, um, things were coming out, Silicon Valley was coming out of silicon and semiconductors. And the conversation with personal computing was moving into a personal conversation and individuals as well as institutional change. And the structural change in institutions was controlled by IBM. Um, and 
and Apple was, you know, for those who are a student of, of Apple's rise, if you will, and then, you know, the, the waxing and waning of Apple and then the eventual position the company has right now. Um, it, it, it typically was motivated by um, really understanding the, the psychographic uh, as opposed to the demographic of a market. And so understanding the mental model of, of the consumer uh, and what motivated them. And that was sort of essential to the work we did in the Macintosh division. Uh, I pioneered some of that thinking when I was initially working on market development activity for the Lisa system, which is what I started doing. And that was before the Macintosh even started as a project. And, you know, the company had a great desire to go after structural change in the enterprise with the Lisa system. Um, and I was in charge of figuring out how to introduce that to the corporate marketplace through distribution channels and a, a newly being hired direct sales force. And when the project slipped, it slipped about a year in schedule. Um, I started to uh, take what I was learning and reading the original papers and work around Windows systems and computing and mice and, you know, sort of the original Alto, the mother of all demos, if people have tracked any of that stuff from, from Doug Engelbart and, and the rest. And, and I asked the question uh, of, of the company and that the three or four top people, the president, CEO, the chair, et cetera, and said, why aren't we talking to the people who invented all this stuff? we won't have to sell them anything, they'll buy it because this is what they invented. And so I, I went deep into understanding that facet while I was running a program for the Fortune 500 CEO. So I had the good fortune of being in my early 20s, dealing with the researchers who built these original systems. And my day job, I did all this on my own time, my day job was dealing with CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. Uh, and, and I organized about 90 meetings within less than a year. Um, and it had to be the CEO and the others that came up to five others could be six people had to be officers of the corporation. And that was the filter through which the sales organization we were hiring could bring people in to look behind the curtain and see what we were doing. And then I designed a process to have them put their hands on a keyboard and a mouse none of them had ever seen a mouse before and virtually all of them had full-time dictating machines and a secretarial pool and all kinds of other things to get their letters transcribed and delivered because it was all paper right so so for me um it was really understanding you know the market and the individual was sort of my my primary thing and when i was asked to, to join the Macintosh group, there were about 10 people in the group. Steve had just taken it over from Jeff Raskin. If you read the books, you can know the story. And, um, and, and they said they were interested in communicating with the markets that I had analyzed and understood and said, why aren't we going to go do this? Because uh, the division didn't do it. They failed miserably in their, their focus. And, um, and so I went in and I met with Steve and the couple of engineers that were building things and, um, and they had some ideas. And so I gave them conditions by which I would go do that because I was confident uh, and, and, you know, said, you, you need to let me undo what's been done. You need to let me do it my way and you need to pay me when it's done because um, cause it's, it's going to be a lot of work. Um, so two out of three isn't bad in terms of, of getting what you want. Um, so I got to do it my way and undo everything that they did. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so I set up a, a process and a consortia of major universities, research universities, Stanford and Berkeley were part of it, um, and set up a consortia. And um, through that effort, um, the company launched the Macintosh, there was virtually no uptake in the retail market for 12 months. Um, the inventory supply chain problems and cost structure could have come close to bankrupting the company uh, had we not had the distribution outlet that I set up. Uh, and, and it was good fortune for me and for the company. And then Steve got fired 
and then asked me if I would go with him to start next. And so I said, yes, uh, and there's a story behind that. But so I've mostly been, it's market focus, customer focus, market development work was been, been my areas of interest. Um, and, you know, human potential, which takes me, you know, to the museum today, sort of the impact. Steve had the idea of this wheels for the mind concept, if you're familiar with that. And it was a Scientific American article about um, energy output and distance traveled and human beings were very, very, very low uh, on the curve. Um, I think the condor was at the top with one flap in the wings and energy could float forever, but you put a person on a bicycle and it just changes everything. So the whole idea around the Macintosh was wheels for the mind and, and what do you want it to do for you, the opening uh, presentation. Uh, that was put together. Um, the first slide was a, and the deck was a Cuisinart. Um, so that started the conversation. So anyway. Thank you for sharing because I think there's so many transferable lessons, even though the technology is different now, there's so many uh, lessons that could be highly relevant today. Um, something that you mentioned that really resonated with me was that you had your day job and then at night you were doing all this additional hands-on work. So the willingness to really put your head down and do a lot of the hands-on work, even dirty work if you so well, to just be in front of people is a really important part, especially early in people's careers. So I think that's really great advice. Yeah, I think so. Um, from there, you then transitioned to several roles where you were either early co-founders or you were in a leadership and particular CEO roles of venture backed startups. Um, so uh, it sounds like obviously saying yes to joining Steve and four other founders uh, was a pretty straightforward decision for you. But this is a series of entrepreneurial pursuits. It would be great to hear a little bit more about your experience running things on the startup side after some corporate experience. How was that experience like? Well, um, it's really hard work. It's really hard. Um, and I, I really only ran sort of one and a half companies, if you will. Um, and I had, you know, personal interest in, in both one, one was in and around kids software and education, which at the time was particularly interesting, um, but fleeting. And that was clearly a built for sale company. And I was helping as a consultant and then I, they couldn't raise money unless I went full time. Um, so I said yes, uh, so that they wouldn't fall off a cliff. And, and I helped structure the distribution relationships, one with Apple and one with Compaq that made a difference. Um, but that you know that that was it. I, the other one I was also consulting, and it was focused on intellectual property asset management. This is a period of time before XML, uh, and really before the web was just emerging. Um, and I was generally familiar with a lot of those things. Most people know that. The Timbersley built a web on a next machine using next step. So, I mean, we, we gave him the equipment to go do that stuff. So I was pretty close to the, the beginnings of those things. Um, but I, I do think um, the thing about, about running a company and, and building a startup is um, there's an awful lot of, of, of sort of lonely times in the sense that there's no other person you can look at other than yourself at the end of the day. And everyone that's looking at you is looking, depending upon where they come from, is looking, um, you know, it, 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 a startup by definition, you know, Steve Blank 101, right? You know, an entity in search of a sustainable business model. And you've got it, you've just got to be paying attention all the time. And, you know, having been there in a lot of small companies and actually helped and worked with a ton of small companies in my time at Microsoft on a global basis, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of companies. 
that we work with and enable in various and different ways and just you know hundreds and hundreds of of meetings uh, of young companies and entrepreneurs everywhere in the world i mean you know i had a three-year visa to go in and out of russia which is like you can't get because we were doing so everywhere there's just there's people aspiring to to build new companies but you know there are lots of small businesses and those are really good things so when you think about startup and you and you think about venture backed and looking for something sustainable it's it is a it is a very 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 uh energy intensive hard thing to do and to be successful at so um you know i think there are a lot of good guideposts. I think Brad Feld and, the, and his work uh, with the Foundry Group and the books that he's written, I think are particularly interesting and helpful because there's a lot of social context in that. Brad's a good friend. Um, and, you know, and it, 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 takes, it takes just relentless dedication as I've experienced. Um, so, so I don't know what more I can say other than, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> work really hard is always a great discipline to live by it's better yeah. to be lucky you know i mean that's <laughs> so it's it's um you know it's it's better to be lucky true and Even you do have to make your own luck i mean life is it's about 10 percent what you're presented with and about 90 percent what you do with it i that's one of my personal beliefs mm -hmm. but um but you need to, you know, you need to be immensely committed uh, to those around you, and and be looking for for guidance. And and there are very, um, you know, there are very few entrepreneurs that in the end can build something that is truly, truly scale. I mean, these days it's a lot more different. I mean, I'm 20 years removed from a lot of this. Not that I wasn't paying attention to it, and that I'm still not paying attention to it because I do sit on the board at Stardex uh, was helpful to them when they when they kicked things off originally and then when they wanted to build more of a an operating structure and a board I, I helped them but anyway you, you mentioned your time at Microsoft because obviously post your tenure at Apple and um, working closely with Steve Jobs at Next um, eventually you decided to transition and you were personally recruited by the CEO of Microsoft where you spent almost 17 years of your right. career uh, would be really great to learn a little bit more about the decision to join um, and why you found that to be so meaningful that really that ended up being the largest chunk of the time that you spent uh, in terms of your career. Yeah, I was, um, in fact, it's a friend, uh, it's a Stanford professor that I was hanging around with in this period. I had taken uh, a chunk of time, uh, six months actually, as it turns out, off um sound advice from a friend suggested that when i did take that break i was in a position where i was able to to step back uh, and and take some time and i knew i was going to continue to work i like to work um and i have my worldview of what work means and if you're not sleeping you're working right you can be working to give back you can be working for money you can be working for any number of things. Um, and so being active was really, really important. So I took this time off. And uh, it's a Stanford professor is a good friend. Um, and he had been very successful in one of his companies that he sold. Um, he's one of one of those I won't name him. Um, that's, that's done quite well, two or three times at least. Um, and um, I read this speech that Steve Ballmer gave about uh, XML and web services. And I was helping a friend of my professor friend think about uh, wireless based, um, at the time, two and a half G network, sort of, you know, GPRS networks and transporting sound. Um, without any degradation or loss and things like that. So it's an interesting thing. It was curious whether it was a business model or a technology or you know, a licensing play or what have you, just sort of 
playing around with that. And I had a point of view about what was going to happen in the industry at a macro level. And so I sent an email to Steve uh, Ballmer uh, after reading his speech. It was a six month old speech, frankly. He'd given it just as I unplugged from the network. And back then, 20 years ago, you could, you could unplug from the network there. It was, you know, for the most part, mobile devices existed, but not like, not like today. And so uh, I sent just a two or three line email about if you're serious about web and web services, uh, I think you're going to need to engage Silicon Valley. And I'm gonna do something next year. This was right before the holiday, the annual uh, year end holidays. Um, and, and, I, and I don't wanna move. Um, and he, he just, he happened to be online and he's relentlessly efficient on email and wrote back and just said, this could be interesting, I'll get back to you. And the next day, two days later, I got an email and all it said was, when can you come up? And I got, I, and he copied both of his EAs, he's had two, two helpers. And I just said, um, you're working, I'm not, you pick. <laughs> so I, I went up there uh, on a Thursday night and spent Friday, better part of Friday with him. So my view at the time was again, market-based and structural and um, Microsoft is coming out of the antitrust case. Uh, and, you know, I, I had a worldview about how things were going to evolve around web and web services. And they seemed to resonate with Steve uh, pretty quickly. And within, um, I spent two hours with him and about 20 minutes after he asked me to you know, pull the string and said, okay, what are you interested in? And what do you think about this? And, and so anyway, the long story short is, um, I laid out a, a worldview of how I saw the, the the broader market conditions changing. What was the architecture of of business business models and uh, entrepreneurism, and how it was going to play into Microsoft's future or not? And he liked it. And then the next day. Um, mail me a job offer, faxed it to me, because that's what you do, um, <laughs> to, to be an officer of the company and to go figure that out for them. And so I had uh, carte blanche to sit in his office and have access to everything in the company for 18 months, uh, which is how long it took me to figure out how the company operated. I needed to go through a planning cycle to see how they made decisions uh, and how units of value were created inside the company. What were the atomic units? How did people get compensated? What were their behaviors? And then how were the market conditions gonna be mapped into that? So then I started asking questions along the way about how the company looked at those things. And they sort of mostly said, we don't, you should go do that. And I said, all right. Um, because they were servicing their business model and they were really, really good at servicing their business model. And that's not where the market was. And so I spent a, a significant amount of time against Steve's direction, who was my boss, because he said, um, well, here's how you go about it. When I laid it all out, I said, okay, here, here's, what, here's what I see. And he said, well, here's how you go about it. You know, send an email to my direct report, you copy me and I'll weigh in. And I just said, hey, with all deference to you as the CEO, this place is designed to repel against what you just asked me to do and it will fail. And he sort of looked at me and I just said, I'll do what you ask. He goes, well, if it doesn't, what would you do? I said, I'll go bottoms up. Let's go mark it up, right? It's like, where's the power? The power's in the market, it's in the people. So, um, so anyway, I sent the email, like he said, and I saw him, whatever. I was only in Seattle about once a month. I go up there for a few days. And he said, so like, what's everybody doing? And I said, what do you mean? And they completely ignored me. It's like, I told you, know, it's like, what are you going to do about it? I said, I told you what I'm going to do about it. I went bottom up. So anyway, so I did a systematic mapping of, of those units. And then I started looking in the market and mapped that in. And I used Microsoft tools. I used Visio charts and everything else to show all those 
those pictures. And it's not unlike what I did in the startup that I ran around intellectual property asset management. So I took the world's patent databases, starting with US, Japanese, and European libraries, because they're all the abstracts and everything's in English. And I did a mapping of those to corporate P&Ls to show where IP relates to product lines that make money for them or not. And if the patents existed and they were paying global maintenance fees on keeping them alive, multinationals, and it didn't matter to their current P&L, they should auction it off to people who could use it because it was cited as prior art. And so we did a, so I, I found four customers in four different industries, which turned into 16 customers, which turned into 60 customers, and then we sold the company, right? So, so doing a, a dismantling of market conditions against what your technique or your, and if you've got to redo your business model, which in Microsoft was the fundamental case, because if, if you're the, if you're the CEO, uh, you know, at a place like Microsoft and someone comes in and says, all right, so you think the market looks like this and, and it's a, a triangle, a pyramid. And there's 200 or 250 companies at the top of the pyramid that are the big ones. And you're at the top of the pyramid because you make all the profit and you're in an antitrust box and you can't buy anything that's in the top of the pyramid. And then the mid market is part of your channel and how you make your money. And then the developers, the coders are at the bottom of the market who decide what they're going to build for. The reality is in a world of web services, it's not two dimensional, it's a three dimensional thing. And it's not a pyramid, it's a tree. And the trunk that goes into the ground has got venture capital and entrepreneurs in it. And you can't see them, but they're spending a lot more time and money than you are on building market caps in this three-dimensional world as opposed to client server. And they're gonna dismantle billion dollar businesses of which you have 15 in your P&L and turning turn those into $100 million companies with billion dollar market caps because it's an expansive market as opposed to a client server. And so you lay that out and they go, yeah, we're going into web services because we have to, because all these companies that have sprung up, pick your favorite, Yahoo, this, that, the other thing, eBay, they weren't using any Microsoft technology. They didn't need it. So, so you know, it's like, all right, so here's the picture you start with the market, then you look at the arms and legs. So that to me has been a, a, a thematic that worked going back again to, you know, how do, how do you organize groups of people and how do you structural change, right? Innovation, I think, is not about the intellectual property that creates the mousetrap. It's how do you get the mar mousetrap to market? You know, it's like, there, there, it's more, it's the structural change that has the impact in an economic way, right? So that to me is, is th that's the whole system. Uh, and so it's that, that, that's again, if there's any lesson I could draw by giving you these stories, it's, it's, it's that. And I think those that have been, you know, the last you know, pick your favorite number of years, the last 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, the, the amount of structural re-engineering has been, it's just unbelievable, this digital, digital transformation in the, in the last, you know, in the last 12 months at a minimum. But the, the thing that's scary, you know, is what we all know and, and can appreciate is that, you know, what we're auctioning off is attention. And that's, that's, that's a tough one. Right, that's a tough one. Um, anyway. Absolutely. Um, I think that is such a valuable lesson, especially in the theme that you described in terms of whether you're selling direct to customers and individual consumers and individuals or even to enterprises and selling into companies. An important component of this is always being at the forefront of the market, understanding emerging technologies, how it's making structural changes, as well as actually having a pulse in terms of bottoms up, what the market is asking for. And I think regardless of what time we're in, despite all the digital transformations that are happening, 
happening, that thematic lesson is consistent. Yeah, maybe. Um, please. Yeah, good. Um, and that actually is the perfect segue into kind of this third major chunk of your career um, in terms of your role currently now uh, at the Computer History Museum, um, as well as on the board of Silicon Valley Community Foundation in, in terms of thinking about giving back. Uh, uh, some of the folks on this call have likely been to Computer History Museum pre-COVID, but would love to learn a little bit more about your work. I know just as of earlier today, um, the Tech for Humanity prize winners were announced um, yeah. uh, with Sal Khan. He actually spoke at our annual conference last year. He's, uh, so he's amazing and would love to learn more about your current work at the Computer History Museum. Yeah, well, the museum it was always you know, fascinating to me when the inventory moved from Boston to the Bay Area, which was 20 plus years ago, um, the museum in Boston failed. Um, and, uh, and Len Schustick, who's the founder of the museum out here, still uh, closely involved, not on the board anymore. He just left the board a year plus ago. Um, you know, the collection of computing artifacts and then of late, um, oral histories. We have more than a thousand oral histories from the true pioneers. We have all the original Fairchild notebooks. I mean, you can go down this list of stuff that we have that people have never seen for the most part. Um, and we own real estate too. <laughs> the, the, the museum owns seven and a half acres of land surrounded by Google headquarters, five of which is parking lot pretty valuable parking lot um, and two other buildings. One where we do research in around software and things and another is a big warehouse. Doesn't need to be in the Bay Area. It's a pretty expensive warehouse, but nonetheless, we own it. So, so we're, we're a keeper institution and that was you know part of what I saw um, when they asked me if I would run the place. But what I proposed uh, is very consistent with what I said to Len 20 years ago when uh, the inventory was sitting in some Quonset huts on the Moffett Field site. Um, and he was, you know, and his, his wife, I'd worked with at Apple and Donna's a really serious entrepreneur. Palm and Handspring were her companies. I worked with her at Apple. We started the same week and stuff. She's terrific. And Len was a networking pioneer and professor at Stanford, among other things. And, and she's really, they're really interesting people. But I said to him, um, you know, this 20 years ago, um, you know, I, for lack of a better imitation, I gave him my best Steve Jobs imitation. I said, Len, this is really interesting stuff, but who cares? It's like, like, so what? You got a bunch of old iron here? And so like, what is this institution gonna stand for? You know, before we know it, I mean, 20 years ago, it was reasonably predictable what was going to be happening in the world today. Um, you know, I've been friends with Alan Kay for a long time, right? It's sort of like dying a book, you know, it's like, okay, it's going to happen. There's an inevitability. And so the question is, you know, what, what did, what did you want to be? So when I, when I talk to them about it, um, the museum has this incredible collections. And so the picture that I painted, as I said, look, we have this incredible, oak tree, we have this tree trunk, which is the buildings, and we have this root system of stuff. And we have no branches, and we don't reach, we have no leaves. And if you don't have leaves that are as big as the drip line, the tree will die. You know, I mean, it's like you, you need to catch the water, you, you know, you have to have this thing. So I so said, we have to reposition the institution. And we have to do what was appropriate technically. And then we need to make a decision now about what we think we will look like 10 years from now. And that's a physical digital statement. And so the repositioning was to turn it from a pure collections institution. Of course, we're a museum and we collect stuff. But the new positioning is to decode technology, is computing past, digital present and future impact on humanity to shape a better future. So why is that? When people say tech, they typically think this industry, but more importantly, when we say it's computing past, that's where we get our agency. We have all this stuff and it's hidden. So that's the second piece. 
the technology? How do you how do you unleash it all? The digital present is the topic of the day. Is it is it life sciences? Is it energy? Is it education? Is it is it uh, health? Is it you know algorithms? And are they racist? And I mean, what what? It's like the topic of the day, and that's going to move because the digital present is, and the framework is AI and innovation, changes in structure and data driven use of computing. Right. The future impact on humanity, the idea there is that whether we all know it or not, we're all environmentalists, right? Because I guarantee everyone on this call wants fresh water and clean air every day. And if you don't have clean air, you start choking pretty quickly. And if you don't have clean water, certainly within 24 hours, you're not gonna be a happy camper, right? Some people act on it. They live in a city, they use a sharing economy, they don't drive, or some people buy a Tesla because they think, okay, I can do my part. And some people buy a Tesla to go zero to 60 under two seconds to drive to their second home and then get on an airplane and go to their third, fourth and fifth home. And those are the people that need to be giving back so that everybody knows that they're an environmentalist. And what I mean by that is that when you wake up in the morning and you act, as a human being that we could reach, you are shaping the history of computing by what you do, how you choose to behave, the way you interact with systems, right? There needs to be an informed citizenry. And we'll start with audiences that are a little more super geeky, but we eventually need to reach a very broad audience so that people can be aware of that. So the technical side of it, we decided to attack using cloud services. And I struck a partnership with Microsoft, not because I worked there, but because they actually have the attendant right pieces structured in a way. And they're actually building a go-to-market <laughs> around the industry they call GLAM, which is galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. So the moment I found someone who said, we're gonna go make money doing this, we're gonna change the structure of how museums, galleries and archives and libraries present information so that it can be composed and constructed into lifelong learning material. Aha, uh -huh. so we're betting on them and others, Nvidia, Adobe, Salesforce, Ring Central, Accenture, they're all helping us, but we're building the 21st century architecture, open, Programming interfaces abound. There'll be APIs everywhere for plugging and different things, but a cloud-based infrastructure set of services for 21st century cultural institutions to share. And we're working with a couple others that will be we're, we'll be first among a handful of helping create this architecture. So that's the technology commitment. And then the third is what do we look like 10 years from now? Do we have to own all the real estate? If COVID continues and our financials are bad for whatever reason, we'll sell some real estate. But more importantly, anything that we do physically will have a digital component, a twin as necessary, or an extended reach. And, you know, as you all know, off the shelf today, you can go to the web and do these things on your own. You can upload your own videos and have them translated in real time with closed captioning in 60 languages. Why not? Right? So, and us, if not us who is sort of my position. So we're going after that quite aggressively. So I looked at that and said, I'll have a 10 year worldview. I will not promise 10 years of my life and time, but I won't leave the institution flat footed to achieve that outcome. So we're painting that picture, you know, by 2022, which is by the end of 2022, which is the, the plan we wrote originally we will build the infrastructure to reach millions. Pretty soon we're gonna start crafting the plan 2025, which will be how we will execute on that, what resources we need and what the gap analysis is on resources and, and audience and market to make that happen. But it, it was a challenge and a bit of a legacy challenge and that the institution needed to be a sustainable institution and it was not on course to be a sustainable institution. And my visual for that is, as I said, um, and I'll, all of these things I'm going to say, in most cases, I've stolen from someone else because, because that notion of great artists stealing is, is true. 
uh, it's a, it's a, was a Picasso quote. And some people attribute it to Steve Jobs um, saying it, but in fact, he got it from my now ex-wife and we were coming back from San Francisco in the car because she was into Picasso. But anyway, so that's where he got it because he stole it. And so ah. I, I'll say that to you guys. But my point is, and what I said is, there's this windshield in front of us what people care about. And we've been looking in the rear view mirror. And you got to have a rear view mirror. In fact, in the computing space, we got a backup camera. Nobody else has got one but us. We've got all the stuff. We know what's behind us and we can pull it out, but we need to present it to the future within the context of what people care about today. And so there's you know, that is the audience question. That is the market question. You know, life as we know it doesn't exist without computing. Anyone that we would reach and talk to in any way, shape or form, you know, you tell me what you could do today without computing in your life. Very little. And yet, you know, where do you go when the last piece of your primary exhibit is an iPhone and now it's a 13 year old exhibit. And when I started, it was a 10 year old exhibit. And as I said to the trustees, explain to me why our website does not render on a mobile phone. And I had some trustees say, well, I can find things and they're stretching the screens around and all this kind of stuff. And I said, you, my friends are not our market. <laughs> The people who come to our website and leave immediately are coming to the website on a phone. And guess what? This is what the traffic says. It's like, so, but everybody's like, but we have all this great stuff. I go, yeah, I know, I know. We could talk about Fortran all day long. But, <laughs> but anyway, so, so that's, again, it's the same, you know, I've, I've personally found um, that you know, figuring out a particular pattern and having a, a lens uh, and, and refining it um, is really important. And it, it's a constraint framework, but if it works for you, then keep using it. So build, you know, I, I guess if anything that I would abstract is to say, whatever the constraint framework is that works for you, if you happen to be really good at algorithms, right? Or you're really good at data, wh whatever it is that you are, those are things that I'm not good at, right? I'm not good at math, remember? So actually I was pretty good at math. I had a second grade teacher who taught us binary. So, so things were like, I was lucky in that regard, right? I got it right away. And, and it's like, oh, I came to California, it's 1976. And the first guy that I met was running the, the Kestrel Institutes doing crypto work for the NSA. It's like, oh, Cordell, let us talk, right? So, so I, it's like, who are these people that you know, are building Silicon Valley back then was, was amazing. So anyway. So I know, um, Daniel, you have a time constraint. So I'll ask one last question from my side so that um, we can address direct questions from students um, at the round table, okay. um, which is that you shared such a compelling and inspiring vision of the work at Computer History Museum. I really would love to leave everyone here today with some practical action steps. How can they better engage in the work? Um, obviously, when things go back to normal, we'll have our next in-person event um, at Computer History Museum. So other than sure. visiting the exhibit in person, what are some of the other ways they can potentially plug well, in? Thank, thank, thanks for asking that. Um, I'm, we are re, well, volunteering. We have 100 plus, I don't know, we have a volunteer uh, event celebration last week was national volunteer week we, we have board meetings all week so we're doing our thing tomorrow but you know volunteering is 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 one thing but you know in what area to what end um there was a group that existed when i started that was um for lack of a better term was called next gen and it was a community of people typically under 40 or so just to use an age uh, some constraint and uh, product manager types, coders, what have you, people that had some affinity and interest. And it was, it, it was kind of going, it was, it was dormant. They were without a CEO for the better part of a year and, and things weren't you know, maneuvering. And the person that started it was starting a family and everything. So anyway, long story short, there is that a woman named Angela Tran, who's now on our board of directors, um, took over that group. And one of the things that I did with the trustees um, 
again on on in my first uh, nominating uh, committee meeting when I said, okay, what do you want the board to look like in the future? And I said, you know, not the way it looks today. Um, and and under certain conditions, I won't be able to recruit the people to the board that I need on the board for this to be the kind of institution that it should be 10 years from now. How do we start now to make that happen? And so Angela is now formally on the board. Um, and we just, um, last week, uh, Thursday, um, voted unanimously to bring another uh, young person onto the board, uh, a woman named Erin Teague, who works at Google. Um, she happens to be a black woman uh, with computer science and, and Harvard business degree, among other, and she does AR and VR work on YouTube in the sports area. So, so we are repopulating our board with people who have an affinity for working with and helping the institution over time. And we intend now that we're building a critical mass of new board members with different backgrounds and skills uh, and diverse, um, you know, I, I'm one, I'll, I'll, you know, there's a lot of old white guys on this board, right? And I'm not on the board, actually, that's not the way the structure works, but we're, we're, we want to reflect our community and our audience and our reach. So we are, with Angela's help, going to be rethinking the best way to engage if you will, people younger in career who have an affinity for, for, for wanting to learn about nonprofits, learning how to give and participate. And we're creating and have advisory groups, collections advisory group. We have um, other advisories on marketing. Um, we need, I desperately need help in thinking around growth metrics, people who are living and breathing scale and growth so, you know, D. Lewin, first initial, last name at computerhistory.org. There you go. Uh, or D. Lewin at live. It's even shorter and easier. Live.com. Same, just first initial, last name altogether. Um, and, and, you know, we've got a number of, of individuals who, who, again, can volunteer and help us look at data. We're, 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 we're implementing systems. I had 32 databases. I've got one now. Um, we're building up from it. You know, I mean, that's, it, it really was. It, was, it was this beautiful institution with this incredible collection and these world-class exhibits and a beautiful building, but the systemic stuff for reaching, uh, you know, the, the tree limbs and the leaf, it's just like, that was not, you know, that was not, it was just, that was my job, right? Go figure that out. So that's, that's that. So anyway, thanks for asking. So anybody that's interested, you know, well, there's, that's perfect. I can attest to the fact that Angela is awesome. She's a fellow she's Canadian great. and yeah. she's done a lot of wonderful work. So um, we'll definitely include that in our follow-up email for all the attendees um, right. for anyone who's interested in volunteering. Um, with that, thank you so much for your time with us today. We would love to transition to the round table. So okay. um, folks there have a question, uh, have the opportunity to ask you questions directly. Okay. Um, great. With that, thank you everyone for coming as well. Okay. Thanks. Hopefully some of this is helpful. The stories are fun. Super helpful. Thank okay. you, Dell. Um, if you can just click join roundtable, all of us in the roundtable will be in that Great. program. Right. So for those of you who were invited to join the roundtable, um, you can join. Otherwise, this marks the end of tonight's session. Thank you all for coming, and we certainly hope to you enjoy the session and a few takeaways. We will also be uploading the recording on our YouTube and be sending the link to everyone. So subscribe to our YouTube and also look at our other social media channels like LinkedIn, Facebook, um, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, we hope to see you again at our next speaker event next Wednesday on Friday, May 5th, Wednesday, May 5th from 1 to 2 p.m. PDT. Um, for those of you, okay, so now let's join the round table. And um, for our future events, if you'd still like to join the roundtable, you can apply through the Eventbrite. Yeah, great seeing you all here tonight.